When we wrapped up last time, we were just on the verge of you starting to engage with Kaiser Permanente as a, as a potential job candidate. I know the story is a lot more complex than, uh, than you applying for a job. In fact, it doesn't really work out like that. Um, I actually didn't apply for the job. You didn't apply for the job. So, you know, maybe before we even start talking about Kaiser, why don't we um, step back and um, let you tell us about what your, your life was like at age 55 um, when you did make this transition. And what were you working on um, and how did you see your future at that point in time? The path that I was on at age 55 was a dual track. And on one track, I was running a health plan. Health partners, roughly a million members, vertically integrated. We owned the hospitals, clinics. Um, we were very much a Kaiser-like model. Um, and I was running that and doing work to continuously improve the processes inside that organization. And we had just won the, the award, Robert Wood Johnson Award, first for uh, best health plan, basically, in the country relative to quality. So it was a good path. I would like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Writing books on those topics, having a good time. And intending to stay there, and I was intending, the path I was on was a path to retire at age 60. So I had set myself up financially and set myself up logistically to have uh, the ability to go to track two. And track two was to work on issues of diversity and ethnic conflict. And the work that I wanted to do was to help groups of people understand why they fight with each other and why they're at war with each other and then to help people figure out ways of not fighting with each other and getting along and, and creating uh, a collaborative environment that's um, good for everyone. So I was on a path to get to a win-win environment for the country and not just healthcare. And I was doing all kinds of work and research to do that. And I'd started doing that work in a very uh, direct way. Uh, back on a trip that I took to Wales uh, back in 1987. And I went, went to Wales and I was helping the health board in Wales. They, they were studying what we had done and they wanted to know whether or not they could do something similar to create vertically integrated care, systematic care, and um, so they had heard what we had done, they'd read some of what I had written and they invited me to, to go to Wales and present to the, the board. And I made the mistake of saying what an incredibly beautiful, lovely English setting we were in. And they explained to me that it wasn't England and it was Wales and that the England uh, was basically their oppressor, their captor, uh, they hated the English and they were deeply insulted by me not knowing the difference between Welsh and English. And we basically, uh, the project went nowhere, yeah. died. And the anger surprised me. And I said, I actually said, wait, isn't, isn't the Prince of Wales the person who's going to inherit the throne in England? And they said, that's an honorary thing, that's a token thing, that, that's basically just something that they've given us uh, so that we feel better about being captive to the English. And I said, okay, this is not what I expected. But what was fascinating was, is I talked about that, and then uh, immediately following that talk to some people from Scotland who expressed very similar feelings, it was that I heard um, language and intergroup anger and conflicts that were exact parallels to what I'd heard back in the U.S. And I had been working on civil rights. I'd done some civil rights work in, in the Twin Cities. I'd done a little bit of work with the American Indian Movement. I had friends in the American Indian Movement and I was helping with some of their issues. I had been uh, doing a little work for the Spokesman Reporter uh, newspaper in the Twin Cities. Uh, it was a black newspaper. And uh, I thought I was uh, uh, trying to help, my goal was to help with those issues and those agendas. I was on the board of the community clinics for the Twin Cities and doing some work in that area. 
And I heard the same language and the same anger and the same stories, basically, in Wales that I had heard on the south side of St. Paul. And, and this is something that goes back four or five hundred years. And it goes, goes back centuries. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I said, wait, th th this seems to be an intergroup thing, and maybe we didn't invent racism in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So I started to study um, the conflicts that were going on in the world. And there were conflicts in Kosovo, there were conflicts in, in multiple places. And one of and they were always described in the newspapers as being ideological. Left wing, right wing in these countries, two political parties are at war with each other. And so I, I started looking at these countries, drilling down, discovered that every single one of them was tribal. That every country I went to and looked at the the uh, conflicts that were going on were tribal conflicts and they followed the same patterns of the racial divide that we saw in the US and that we were seeing in Wales and, and London. So I started studying this. Can you define for me what you mean by tribal? Literally tribal. A tribe is a set of people that has a common identity as a tribe. They speak a language as a tribe. They have a shared history as a tribe. And if you ask the people in the tribe who they are, they say, I'm French, or they say, I'm, I'm uh, Bogondan, or I'm, you know, pick, the, pick the nation. So it could be national, it could be religious, it could be racial. The tribes are mostly ethnic and uh, literally uh, cultural, uh, but you can, one of the things I learned later is you can actually trigger the same sets of instincts and behaviors based on religion or based on other issues. But even on the religion side, when I, when I drilled down into religion, I thought that the issues in Ireland were religious. Everyone says, so I went to Ireland. And religion has nothing to do with those conflicts. It's the people who were from Scotland who were imported to Ireland who live in Northern Ireland. And they basically hate the people who are the original Irish extraction. They hate each other. And it's totally tribal. Mm -hmm. That is a completely, it's masquerading as religious. But it's not religious on any level. And intermarriage doesn't happen between those two sets of people based on tribal issues. So I talked to people on, on both sides in Northern Ireland and Ireland. And th then I looked at the issues around the world and the Shiite-Sunni conflicts that are going on in the world are always tribal. There's really, I mean, the, the religious aspect of that goes back a couple thousand years. All of those people made selections as tribes and they picked a path and now they dislike each other as tribes and nobody converts from one if it were truly religious, one of my standards for religious is there would be a conversion opportunity. Mm -hmm. You could actually make an individual choice to be a, a Shiite or a Sunni. And there is so little opportunity to do that that both sets of those folks in some countries will execute anyone who attempts to convert to anything else. And so it is totally tribal, you could masquerading. Marriage, intermarriage is, yeah, forbidden in, in, in those settings. and. I'd, I went to um, uh, Bangladesh mm -hmm. and, and talked to a, a family in Bangladesh and, and they basically said, if our daughter married someone from the next village, that would dishonor our family to the point where the rest of our daughters couldn't marry anyone. Mm -hmm. That it, it's just totally our group, our ethnic group, and there's no intermarriage. And, and so what we have all over the planet, and I did work in Africa, I did I set up health plans in, in Uganda. I went to Africa and actually set up the health plans. And I learned, after we did the first two health plans, I was told that I had to do the third health plan in a different tribal area or we would be forever branded as being captives of that first tribe. Mm -hmm. And there were 40 tribes in Uganda. We had done two sites with one tribe. So we had to do the third site with another tribe, the fourth site with another tribe. And that made us Ugandan instead of Bogondan. And change the dynamic. But, and in Uganda, I sat down and I talked about these issues, instinctive issues, us them issues, with some of the leaders and had a lot of positive energy. And some of the leaders uh, started using what I was talking about as teaching for their interactions. Because I basically said, you guys are just hating each other for purely instinctive reasons. You really don't deserve to hate each other. You'd be much better off if you come together as a country 
and it, as a region and do things collectively. And the, the only reason you hate each other is because you have instincts to divide the world into us and them. And if somebody is an us, you're protective, supportive, nurturing. If somebody's a them, you're territorial, antagonistic, and hateful, and suspend conscience. And it's really, and it's purely instinctive. It, they don't really deserve to be treated that way. You just feel that because your instinct is activated that causes you to feel that. So basically, rise above it. Invite this other tribe to be an us, and then you together can be collectively strong. And it actually um, was influential. There were, there were people who believed that and, and, and looked down that path. But I, I started the work in, in uh, Wales. I started doing the research, and two years later, I wrote my first draft of a book on intergroup conflict. And then I started looking for the research. I started reading what is available out there on those issues and discovered there was very little available on, on the tribal issues, but there was a lot available on sociobiology. So I started reading um, Edmund Wilson. I, I started reading um, Francis Crick. And there, there were a series of, of, of really good uh, people who were writing insightful works that talk about how affected we are as human beings by sociobiological issues, how, how much our world is structured by our, our biology and structured by our instinctive behaviors. And um, I was actually doing a little bit of personal psychoanalysis at that time with a, a, a Jungian psychoanalyst who I really loved. He was a great guy. And um, he was basically talking about Jung believing that any time there's a common pattern across the planet, the common pattern exists for instinctive reasons, that the only thing that's universal that could drive the same patterns of behavior everywhere is instincts, because we all have instincts, and there's no teaching mechanism that can get those behaviors to every site. So I started looking for instincts, and I started making lists of instincts, and I started trying to figure out what instinctive patterns would look like, and I started identifying patterns of instinctive behaviors in organizations, in communities, and identified the fact that if, if a behavior was absolutely universal, and if it was historical, if we could see it back into history, and if there were parallel versions that happened for other species, hierarchies, turf, there's a whole series of things that we have, lions have, wolf packs have. If there was a, a parallel behavior in other species, there was a high likelihood that the behavior was instinctive. And then I started looking at how instincts affect us. And how do we follow instincts? What, what drives us to do things that are instinctive? And when you look at bees and you look at ants, you see incredibly complex choreography of behavior that comes from sheer instincts. And when you look at humans, you see somewhat similar patterns. We have maternal instincts, so everywhere on the planet we're maternal. And what we do that's different than the ants is we create cultures, which we instinctively create. Every group of people that exists creates a culture for that group. And we embed in the culture the tools we need to achieve the instinct. So we have a maternal instinct, so every culture creates its rules and infrastructure to be maternal. We have territorial instincts, so every culture creates its rules and its instincts that actualize our territorial instincts. We have hierarchical instincts. So every culture creates a hierarchy. And some hierarchies are elected, some hierarchies are appointed, some, some are hereditary. There's all kinds of variation. We are very creative in the specifics of the culture. But the culture always supports the instinct, and the instinct is, is the same. So the, the underlying pattern happens everywhere. So I learned that, and I started writing about it, and doing various work with it. And then I recognized that that was absolutely true in corporate management. So as I led the organization I led, and that was an organization with 10,000 employees and seven labor unions and multiple levels of professions, doctors, I saw that there were all kinds of behaviors inside the organization that were tribal, that we had behaviors where the, uh, there were some issues with some, uh, the doctors versus the people who ran the hospitals. Clear us them thinking there were some, and and before that I'd actually been the chief of planner for a large hospital system, the health central system, and when I did that work, I saw the same thing there. 